Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Scotland. And today we're here in the city of Edinburgh, where behind me you'll see the iconic image of Edinburgh Castle. But we're not here to discuss Scotland the Brave, but Scotland the Brand. Last week we discussed the importance of soft power and how the UK uses it internationally. Today we're going to talk about the importance of a brand to a nation and how that image can contribute to the success of an economy. But first, to your tweets, your messages and your emails. Now our shows on Gibraltar generated a lot of interest and in advance of that when we made the announcement, Fiona Graham said, wow, this will be really interesting. This show is covering so many interesting issues that others are not. Well, thank you very much, Fiona. We hope to continue to do that. John says, great series on Gibraltar. A wee heads up though, TVs don't automatically generate subtitles. They need to be broadcast with the show. Thanks very much, John, for correcting me on that. We are definitely going to look into subtitles. Susan says, another core of a show from Alex Salmond. First of three, enlightening the place to brought a place in the Brexit circus. Again, thank goodness, Taz and he are setting the political commentary pace with an inspired production. Watch out and watch it. Lynn says, Alex Salmon Show, what a fascinating series on Gibraltar. Lovely sunny place. Where's your tan, Alex? Well, we can ask him. And finally from Manuel, he says, if you watch this relative to the Gibraltar shows, you'll think Gibraltar is actually fun. But Manuel, a few people tweeted in to say it really is. But thanks for your comments anyway. Now, the labelling of Scottish produce has been the subject of some controversy over recent months. And there has been the campaign Keep Scotland the Brand. Alex now speaks to Martin Hannan, who's a journalist involved in leading that campaign. Well, Martin Hannan, columnist with the, the National Newspaper, but for the purpose of this interview, campaigner for this Scotland the Brand concept, both writing about the controversy sweeping the country and also campaigning to instigate even more. It does seem to the observer a quite unlikely issue to be stirring up so much political controversy. Why is that? Well, first of all, let me just explain what happened. That It was the readership of the National um, who, at the same time as a lovely woman called Ruth Watson was starting her campaign, Keep Scotland a Brand, um, our readers were sending in examples of what had happened um, in their local shops and in their supermarkets where things were starting to be uh, emblazoned with the Union flag rather than the saltire. Um, the so saltire yes, being the flag of Scotland. saltire being the flag of Scotland. And packets of food would say things like made in Britain. And then underneath it, it would say uh, grown in Angus. In so Scotland. isn't Angus part of Scotland and Scotland is part of Britain? Well, the prob problem is that by not accepting the unique Scottish brand, the supermarkets and the retailers in general have actually weakened the product because Scotland is seen, with many, many polls, many surveys have shown this, Scotland, uh, food and drink in particular, is seen as high quality, very high quality. And the problem with, we call it union jackery, is that you diminish the Scottishness of it and in turn that diminishes the attractiveness of the food and drink. But wouldn't it be possible for uh, people to put both flags on their produce, the salt on one side, the union flag on the other? What about that? Well, actually, that is happening uh, with quite a few companies, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, it, it, it just actually, the, the big problem is Brexit now. And, and how can Brexit be affecting what companies stick on their, on their produce? Well, in particular, there is a real problem for Scotland now because Scotland has several uh, items uh, which are which have got what is called protected geographical indication now i remember this when i was first minister campaigning for whiskey to get one agreed by the chinese yep well good for you we won that one um and scotch whiskey is probably the best known certainly our biggest export but probably the best known export but don't you mean british whiskey ah now they tried that and um I have on very good authority that um, the sales of British whisky uh, just were non-existent. And they've gone back to um, Scotch. And this, this controversy actually raged into the committee rooms of the House of Commons, didn't it? It did indeed, and um, Ruth Watson uh, gave uh, evidence. and um, She's one of the key campaigners. She's definitely one of the key campaigners now. Um, and it all came from the grassroots, that's the thing that uh, people should realise. This came, it's decided that it was wrong that Scotland's brand was being weakened. Martin Hannah, is there any academic or uh, empirical evidence to show that putting a, a salt on your produce actually increases the sales? Well, 
quite remarkably, Alec, within the last few days, um, there has been the, the, the result of a survey by an organisation called Quality Meat Scotland, who are the trade industry body for all our meat producers. They brought out a survey following their campaign to promote Scotch beef. Scotch beef has protected geographical indication status, and no one else can produce Scotch beef anywhere in the world. The Americans might like to, because part of what they're wanting is to get rid of all of these PGIs, as we call them. But Scotch beef, over the last year in England, now this is in England, this is not in Scotland, in England, the sales of Scotch beef have risen by 7% because of the campaign organised by Quality Meat Scotland to promote Scotch beef. And what's even more extraordinary is that on average, Scotch beef in London is 10% dearer than English or Irish beef. Yet people have been queuing up to buy it, sales are up, and it's a recognition that Scotch beef is a high quality product and must remain so. And after Brexit, if we lose um, protected status for Scotch beef, it'll be a disaster for the industry. The, the success of branding products as Scottish, does it actually speak to, to something more fundamental? What people are saying it is not just Scotland, but what Scotland represents. And do you think it's part of a almost an international desire for things to be distinctive, to have provenance, to have assurance, to have quality? Is that, is that what's behind this? That absolutely is what, behind, what is behind this whole thing, is to promote Scotland as a place that produces high quality food and drink, like Scotch beef, Scotch salmon, Scotch whisky. And we have been very, very successful in recent years in increasing the amount of exports that um, have gone out from Scotland, particularly food and drink. The more that we can prove that we have um, a distinct identity based on things like quality food and drink, the more we do that, the more I think that the people of Scotland will become confident about their own future. And of course, as a representative of the only daily newspaper in Scotland that supports independence, you can bet I welcome that. But wouldn't it be better if, if Scotland were well known as the well, to quote an American offer, the country which invented the modern world, as opposed to the, the country which produces good beef and, and decent whiskey. I think we can be. I think we can both be both. I think that we have a, a record second to none of pr producing inventors, scientists, um, per head of population. I think we've probably got more Nobel prizes than any other country. I think it's only Norway has more per head of population. But you would certainly advocate, as people look at this desultory political scene, that they should be drowning their sorrows in quality Scottish produce. Absolutely, and I look forward to the day when we are independent and we can serve Scotch salmon, Scotch beef, Scotch whisky, but probably French wine. <laughs> well, I can't, uh, I can't uh, recommend French wine in this particular receptacle, but uh, Man Hannan, for your interview, for a delightful interview, you're entitled to the Alex Salmon Quay. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Alec. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now from talking to a, a campaigner for Scotland, the brand, I thought we'd talk to a practitioner, somebody who actually produces the stuff that people want to see the Scottish brand on. Jim Fairley. Uh, first generation farmer, that's pretty unusual. Mostly mm -hmm. it's third, fourth generation if they survive. Yeah, yeah. No, I came into the industry, I was born and bred in the town. Uh, I came into the industry when I was 18. Um, absolutely love it, I love everything about it. Uh, it's got, to me, it's, it, uh, there's a sense of purpose. If you go out in the morning, you're working with stock, there's a purpose. And it's not just about looking after that stock, it's about you're contributing to the environment that you're living in, you're contributing to the, to the food chain that we all, that we all want to eat from, um, and it just feels as though there's proper purpose when you're producing stock. But one of your purposes is to stay in business, which Absolutely. is not always easy among primary producers. So can you point to how branding your produce, let's say your beef, with a, a Scottish identity actually helps you in the bottom line? The Scotch brand, um, run by Quality Meat Scotland, they do annual um, uh, promotions and all the rest of it and they, they'll, they'll target specific um, parts of the country. So they've, they've been very strong at promoting Scotch beef in London, so you'll see big posters down there. And they'll, they'll tell you about growth between anywhere between 3 and 6% of growth of beef consumption down there. Brands work, Wh whatever anybody says. We, we've been accused through the, this whole process where the, the, the brand has been um, let's say diluted, where they've tried to dilute this brand. 
If you want to open a burger stall and you put a great big yellow M over the top of it, the response will be furious, quick and decisive because your brand matters. So whether it's the Scotch brand, whether it's the Jim Fairley brand, whether it's the whatever the brand is, if you get your brand right, it is the most crucial thing you have in your business. So your argument would be in the same way that McDonald's wouldn't let somebody take their brand, yeah. that Scotland should be jealously protecting our brand. A hundred percent jealously protecting them. If you go back to, the, to where this actually started, after the referendum in 2014, you had um, Ian Duncan standing in a room with the Great Britain campaign, and it was all very low key. But what he had was iconic Scottish brands with Union Jacks all over them. Now, I've got no problem with the Union flag. I've got no problem with the Union flag on a product. If people want to sell that as a British product, that's fine. But when you've got product that is on shelves, which you, should be uniquely Scottish, if it's come from, if it's lamb come from Perthshire Hills, then why would you put a Union flag on it? If you, we've already got that bit. We're already that bit ahead. When Richard Lockhead introduced the National Food and Drink Policy... Richard Lockhead was then the Scottish Farming he, Minister. Yes, he was the Agricultural and Rural Affairs Minister. He introduced the, the, um, the National Food and Drink Policy for Scotland and he set up the, the Scotland Food and Drink. That's now the chief executive of that guy called James Withers. James is a fantastic guy and they have done enormous amounts of work to grow the economy, uh, to, to grow the food and drink industry. It's the fastest growing sector in our economy. And they've just released uh, their new document, which is Ambition 2030. And the whole point of Ambition 2030 is that the farming community and the food and drink industry have to collaborate and work together to make it the most dynamic, ambitious, diverse industry in the country. If they get it right, Ambition 2030 will mean that there is 30 billion pounds a year of turnover in the food and drink industry, and we will employ a million people out of a population of one, uh, 5.4 million, yeah. one million people will be involved. Well, that's a fifth in the, of the country. The supermarkets can put whatever they like on, on, a, on a packet. And if they've put a union flag on, I don't believe it's because they've got any kind of agenda against Scotland. I believe it's because they believed that that would increase their sales. And it won't. The Scotland Food and Drink um, uh, survey that they've done has showed clear indications in Scotland that the salt higher sales more than what it would if That's it was a good any other flag. The salt air sells. The salt air sells, exactly. We know it sells, it sells around the world. If you go anywhere in the world in a, in a backpack around Australia, if you've got a salt air on your jacket or whatever, people say, oh, Scots, and they want to talk to you. Why would we allow that to be subsumed? Why would we want to do anything other than promote that? Well, if it's any consolation, I mean, I had a, a period of time where I uh, represented the largest fishing community in Europe. <laughs> Uh, and I used to think that they were fairly set in their ways uh, until they uh, discovered that selling a product as Scots Langoustine meant at least a 10% premium in, in selling it as prawns. I've never seen such a rapid conversion to the word Langoustine in my <laughs> life. So, uh, will, it, will it not be that your, your fellow farmers, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, if they can be persuaded about the bottom line, will be queuing up? to support the brand. We have to maintain the brand and we have to sell that brand with all the visions of this, you know, hills and glens and mist and this iconic feeling of comfort that people get from Scotland. If we sell that, we won't have to compete because we're going to be selling a premium product. There's always going to be people in this country who want to buy in price. There's nothing we can do about that. There's a billion middle class consumers in Asia. By 2020, there will be a billion middle-class consumers. They're drinking the best of French champagne. They're drinking the finest Scotch whisky. We should be having a programme to get native-bred cattle back onto our hills so that we sell the best beef in the world, bar none, come from those hills and glens to that Asian market of a billion middle-class consumers. Sounds like a great ambition. Jim Fairley, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, deliver uh, that campaign of which you spoke. But I can uh, offer you the salmon quake for something to wash it down with. The Absolutely. best of Scottish lamb and beef washed down with the best of the Scottish product. Alec, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for the interview. It, it has been my pleasure. Thank you. So we've heard from a campaigner and a practitioner. Coming up after the break, we'll now hear from an academic on the national branding of Scotland. Welcome back. Continuing with our theme of Scotland the brand, Alex now speaks to academic Professor Joe Goldblatt. 
Now, Professor, you're one of the international authorities on brand image for tourism purposes. Uh, but is there a way to, to, to measure the success of this academically uh, beyond just counting the number of visitors you get to your country? Actually, measurement of tourism branding is relatively new and only goes back about 40 years. And there are multiple indexes that are used. However, in reality, one of the most important measurements is brand personality. And would you say that, that Scotland has had substantial success or in this area, or do you think we're still underplaying our assets? For a nation of only 5 million people to attract 25 million tourism tourists annually, Scotland punches way above its weight in terms of the tourism agenda. Now looking at the, the last few years, uh, what would you, can you identify uh, themes or events which have been particularly successful in, in branding Scotland? Well, if we go back to 2009, Homecoming Scotland, this was really the seminal year which led to all of the theme years that followed. As a result of Homecoming Scotland, it's repeated again in 2014, but this time alongside the Ryder Cup and the Commonwealth Games. And uh, do other countries sort of uh, look at that and say, ha, huh, that's something we could, uh, we could do as well? So it does it. There's a lot of emulation goes on in, in this sort of branding uh, uh, visitors and tourism numbers. That's a really good question because, in fact, other nations have tried to emulate Scotland and not been successful. So one of our opportunities is to consult with, license, help develop tourism branding around the world based on the Scotland model. Now, Scotland has a, a strong image for, uh, for visitors and a high percentage of visitors to, to local population. But how about the places within Scotland, what would you point to as examples of cities or towns who've managed to make their mark? Two cities in particular in Scotland have risen very quickly. First, Glasgow with their tourism branding slogan of People Make Glasgow, which was developed by surveying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Glaswegians to come up with words that resonate with the local population. So it's truly authentic. So it's People Make Glasgow. People Make Glasgow, that's right. And then in the city of Edinburgh, the slogan is This is Edinburgh, which allows every citizen to contribute their own voice as Edinburgh is doing now with the Edinburgh 2050 project to develop the future of this, this great city. So from what you say, Scotland ha has achieved a very strong brand identity uh, and has a very high percentage of visitors to, to, to local population. Uh, but is there anything else Scotland should be doing? And from, from your assessment, is there something else they could be cutting through on? Yes, indeed. We should continue to evaluate and analyze brand perceptions of Brand Scotland but in addition, we should not only listen with our head, but also our heart. It reminds me of when the Scottish Parliament building, that beautiful, iconic building, opened in Edinburgh many years ago, and Edwin Morgan wrote that wonderful poem, Open the Doors. He was the macker, the, the national poet of Scotland. That's correct. And Mr. Morgan's poem resonated with the entire country, so that today, our tourism slogan is, Scotland is now, and now is all about opening the doors to everyone to say this is a welcoming caring sharing country we invite you to join us so from a visitor point of view that that's a strong brand identity does that carry forward into to, to people buying products uh, do, do people see that identity as a reason for for purchasing well let's say food products internationally yes people make their decision to purchase tourism items, not just based upon emotion, but also based upon the economic offer. So this is why the challenge of Brexit and the challenge of trade tariffs could negatively impact tourism. And it's very important that we soften this as much as possible. Now, you've uh, talked about some of the successes that, that Scotland has had in, in recent years. We're thinking not just about Scotland, but maybe internationally, are, are there any catastrophic elements that you can, uh, or, 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 or attempts that didn't come off, or, or, or things that were a bit of a faux pas for any particular country. Many years ago, I was invited by the World Bank to assist with the development of the 2000th anniversary of 
the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem as part of the Millennium celebrations. And I advised the mayor of Bethlehem not to release live white doves at midnight because they would fly into the large television lights and in fact be baked. And he asked what would I suggest as an alternative. And I said, similar to what they did at the Lillehammer Winter Olympics, they used latex rubber gloves filled with helium. It created the same effect. They could capture them, reuse them. It was sustainable. Of course, he didn't like my advice. And he released his 2,000 white doves. And they had 2,000 roasted doves on international television. And that's the only message that's remembered, sadly, from that iconic event. So basically you would have choose your slogans carefully uh, and don't roast your peace doves. That's exactly right, especially on the 2000th anniversary of the birth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so there could be many mishaps, but there also been some outstanding successes, not, not just in Scotland, but how people's image of a, a country or a people is actually part of a, a well-chosen and perhaps authentic slogan. Something has to be authentic to work, doesn't it? Two of the most authentic slogans that have ever been developed for tourism purposes are I Love New York, which has been phenomenally successful over the last 40 years and will probably continue to be successful because, again, it was developed organically, similar to This is Edinburgh, allowing the people to connect with the slogan. Because if the residents don't connect with the slogan or with the tourism branding, then no amount of whitewash is going to make this authentic. And thinking of the great successes, I mean, uh, Edinburgh Castle, for example, that's a million and a half visitors a year, wouldn't they be forgiven for saying, listen, folk are going to come to Edinburgh Castle, whether we marked it or not. How do you stop people sitting on their laurels? Look, for 300 million years since that volcano erupted behind us here, people have been interested in this city as a destination. And because Sir Walter Scott literally invented mass tourism with his publication of the poem, The Lady of the Lake, that attracted the English to come up to our beautiful country, tourism is something that is part of human nature. It will only grow from strength to strength. And when the economy actually takes a nosedive, tourism generally rises because people need more escapism. And so you would say, never rest on your laurels, always be looking to refresh your, your image, refresh your band, uh, and keep, uh, keep pushing on. Yes, and one of the ways that Scotland has not rested on its laurels is by promoting film tourism. The UK recently did a study and they identified that 40% of all tourists made a positive decision to visit the UK because of a film they'd seen in their local cinema. Well, where are most of the films in the UK produced these days? On these beautiful lands. And so Scotland is well positioned to grow from strength to strength. Well, P Professor uh, Goldblatt, you're an image of Scotland standing there yourself. But I've got one more piece of Scottishness to give you. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, the Alex Salmond Quaich. Now, I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to tell you the trill, <laughs> but uh, just the best whiskey and only to your close friends. Thank and you I so thank much you. For being when, on the we, show. when we enjoy this quake at our home, we will always drink in the traditional way, like <laughs> this, and think of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I would some poor the gift to give us, to see ourselves as others see us. So said Scotland's national bard, Robert Burns. But what is Scotland's reputation abroad? And how can that be used and utilised to sell Scottish goods and services? Take a look at this recent question in the House of Commons, when Michael Gove was questioned by Dunferman and West Fife MP Douglas Chapman. Uh, Scotland produces some of the finest uh, food and drink uh, which is exported around the world. Uh, it allows us to punch well above our weight in terms of our balance of payments and is based on a valued Scottish brand. Uh, could I ask the Minister what steps is he taking to protect Scotland, the brand, to ensure our reputation for quality food and drink is enhanced during and after the Brexit process? Well, it's a very constructive contribution, actually, because Scotland, uh, as a brand, is a very powerful one. I mentioned whisky and smoked salmon earlier, but it is the case that the uh, uh, high-quality food producers of Scotland, from uh, those who are responsible for um, uh, beef in the northeast of Scotland to those who are responsible for the, uh, the, the wonderful organic carrots and potatoes of Aberdeenshire, these food producers are individuals who work incredibly hard, whom it's my desire to champion, and that's why I'm just a little bit sad 
a little bit sad that the First Minister of Scotland has decided not to collaborate with the UK Government in making sure that we have effective UK-wide frameworks in order to provide a firm platform for exports and growth in the future. Now, Douglas Chapman joins me now. I'm delighted to say you didn't get too much change out of Michael Gove there. I'm not sure how familiar Michael Gove, who was brought up in the northeast of Scotland, seemed to be with the range of Scottish produce. Well, the uh, range of Scottish produce is, is, is fantastic, and we all know that. And the, the, the quality, especially in the food and drink sector, uh, is uh, beyond compare, I would suggest. Uh, but certainly the, the, the way that uh, Scotland has been promoted uh, abroad uh, needs to really get a big shot in the arm because uh, we need to, uh, post-Brexit, if Brexit's going to happen, uh, then post-Brexit we need to be out there selling Scottish goods uh, across the globe uh, like never before and also keep retaining our, our European markets which are exceptionally strong from a Scottish perspective. Well, I noticed that Michael Gove in answering your questions seemed to be running out of products. I mean, organic carrots are wonderful in Aberdeenshire, believe me, but uh, it wasn't necessarily the, the first uh, selection of uh, range of products that I would have gone to. But would you say this is a case to well, a, a veteran uh, SNP campaigner in Scotland, the, the redoubtable Winnie Ewing, once said, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. Mm -hmm. Is that the, the sort of message you're putting forward? Well, absolutely, but it needs to be really, really pragmatic because what we, we should be about is making sure that we have a strong, successful Scottish economy. And at the heart of that can be the, the, the fantastic produce that uh, comes from Scotland, not just in organic carrots, but across the whole spectrum of food and drink and other uh, services and uh, produce that we, that we can produce in our, our, our fantastic country. Douglas Chapman, thank you so much. Thank you. It's the iconic image of Scotland. Heather, tartan, bagpipes, wild men and wild women as well. And Edinburgh Castle, the guardian of the nation. Now these are the images which have stood Scotland in good stead, not just in marketing itself for tourism, but marketing its products worldwide. But from what we've heard today, there is a more sophisticated underpinning of that brand, of that image of Scotland. Something that touches on scientific invention, quality of food, authenticity. These are the things that cut through in the modern world. So Scotland the Brave is very important, but so is Scotland the brand. So from myself and Tasmina and all at the Alex Salmon Show, it's goodbye from Edinburgh for now.